And welcome to the December 19th, 2023 meeting of the Fitchburg City Council. I now call this meeting to order. Please be advised that FATV will be recording this, uh, is conducting audio and video recording of this meeting for public broadcast. I would ask that anyone else in the audience who is recording this meeting to please identify yourself for the record now by standing and stating your name and city of residence. Seeing none, at this time I would ask that all electronic devices be placed in silent mode. Councilor Schultz, would you please lead us in a salute to the flag? Certainly. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of, of the United, United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Councilor Schultz? Here. Council Squalia? Present. Council Van Hasinger? Here. President Zarella? Here. Councilor Boschman? Here. Councilor Kucher? Here. Councilor Cragen? Here. Councilor Cruz? Here. Councilor Di Natale? Here. Councilor Fleming? Here remotely. Councilor Green? Here. We have 11 members present. Thank you very much. Uh, we have no one. Uh, on Zoom for public forum this evening. If there is anyone in the audience who wishes to participate in the public forum, you may approach the center podium, identify yourself for the record by name and city of residence, and indicate which agenda item you would like to address the council on, and you may then speak on that item for not more than two minutes. All right, seeing no public comment, uh, we will move to our announcements. Uh, the next meeting of the Widowed Helping Widowed Support Group will take place on Thursday, December 28th, 2023, uh, from 4 until 5 p.m. I have a correction, uh, Kyle, sorry to interrupt. It's gonna be at 91 Seneca Street the December 28th, because Fitchburg State is actually closing the campus for the week. Ah, okay. So uh, from 4 until 5.30 p.m. at 91 Seneca Street. Uh, Was the Kelly, date on that again? December 28th. Kelly Lynn and Bernie Schultz will co-facilitate. Uh, there is a local crisis in our pet shelters and an overpopulation of kittens and cats. Fixing your cat will help keep them healthy and reduce the number of strays and ferals. The Catmobile, sponsored by the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society, will be coming to Fitchburg on Thursday, January 18th. Oh, that was, oh, January 18th, I'm sorry. I'm looking, I'm saying, that's yesterday. Uh, the Catmobile will be parked at the Fitchburg Fire Department, 33 North Street, here in Fitchburg. This is a low-cost mobile vet clinic, which will spay or neuter your family cat for a reduced fee. Other vaccination services will also be available. For those who receive government assistance, vouchers are available through the Mass Animal Fund, and you can reach out to the Fitchburg Lemonster Animal Control Officer at 978-956-4082 to see if you are eligible. Appointments can be made online only starting on December 20th, which is tomorrow. Uh, visit MR frs.org and go to calendar. And Councillor Squalio, was this intended as a public announcement or just a handout? Sure, yes. Okay, and uh, then also there will be an inaugural swearing-in ceremony for Mayor-elect Squalia, the City Council, and the School Committee at the Fitchburg High School Auditorium, 140 Arnhow Farm Road on Tuesday, January 2nd. Uh, doors will open at 6 p.m. and the program will begin at 6.30 p.m. That concludes our announcements. Uh, and we have the report of the Appointments Committee. Uh, Councillor Kucher. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we had, uh, earlier this evening, we had a meeting of the Appointments Committee, and we took up a new appointment for the Chief Engineer, Fire Chief of the Fitchburg Fire Department, Mr. Dante W. Suarez, and it was uh, unanimously approved. Move to accept the report. Oh. Oh. Go right ahead, Chief. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, as I spoke earlier, I just wanted to thank the Council I feel very lucky and privileged to be in this position. Um, you know, these past two years, I think that we've completed a lot. We still have a lot more work to do, um, but it was not, you know, there's definitely a team effort um, with the department, uh, the city council, um, other city departments, we worked well together. And, in, and especially a nice thanks to the, to the Mayor Di Natale and his staff. Um, they supported us just as you guys have done. And we look forward to working with Sam Squalia um, in the coming months as soon as she um, uh, takes office. So thank you. Um, I'll answer any questions that anybody may have. Any questions? You can ask questions now. Perhaps. It depends <laughs> on what they are. <laughs> well, he wants me to ask him a question. <laughs> I think I know the answer, Counselor. It's, I, I have mean, to be careful about how I answer that. I'm, I'm going to protect Clegon, and it's going to be under budget. Okay. <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Move to accept the report of the committee. Second. I have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposition? It is unanimous. 11 to 0. Congratulations. Thank you. I would now ask that the council please clear the bench.
to do on the I do need to now ask that everyone please uh, take further conversation out uh, outside so that we can proceed. Take further conversation outside. I thought you were talking to me. Did your final I council meeting? Fast. I know. <laughs> we had a good retreat this week. All right. Before I go to Councillor Boschman and then into the meat of our presentation, I'd just like to also take a moment uh, since we've just, since this is the last council meeting of the year, I'd like to take a moment to thank Mayor Di Natale for his years of service to the city, uh, for all the progress that he has made and all the projects he has led, and wish him all the best in his retirement. It was a team effort, Mr. President, and uh, that was I was fortunate to have uh, uh, just an outstanding group uh, from department heads to direct reports to me. So, thank you. Thank you. now have the report of the appointments committee. Councillor Boschman. On appointments? Or uh, sorry, records. You're giving me all nerved up there. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, members of the council, for the weekend of December 5th, 2023, the records are in, in order and I greatly appreciate what the young girls are doing in City Cork. Good job. Motion to approve the report of the community on records. Second. I have a motion and second. If there is no objection, we will take this by unanimous consent. And it is unanimously approved. Uh, we have a few communications from, well, actually we have many communications from His Honor the Mayor. Uh, with the leave <coughs> of the council, I will waive reading of the reappointments and just read off the new appointments. Any objections? No objections. Thank you. Uh, new appointment, Nancy Donahue as a member of the Fitchburg Council on Aging, term to, be, term to expire December 5th, 2026, and Ellen Corduan as a member of the Fitchburg Disability Commission, term to expire January 1st, 2027. The rest are reappointments and will all stand referred to the appointments committee. Next up, we have a special presentation uh, by DPW Commissioner Nick Erickson and some private uh, contractors. Uh, you did say private contractors, right? Yes. Okay, just wanted to make sure private. that I wasn't like not recognizing someone. Um, private partners, how I'd like to refer to. Sure, private partners. That we have with us tonight. Uh, on the city's efforts to repurpose the former West Wastewater Treatment Facility into an anaerobic digestion facility. And you may proceed when ready. All right, so thank you for the opportunity to speak in front of you this evening. Uh, my name is Nicholas Erickson. I'm Commissioner of Public Works for the City of Fitchburg. With me to my, tonight, I have Mark McNamara, who's the Deputy Commissioner of Wastewater at DPW. I also have Attorney Steve Torres, who's our outside counsel. And to my right, I have Tom Bintz, who's the CEO of Rollstone Renewable Energy, LLC. Um, and as I mentioned, that's the, the private partnership piece of this. Um, so tonight, we're gonna be presenting on Fitchburg's Regional Renewable Energy and Biosolids Management Facility, um, which will be located at the city's West Wastewater Treatment Facility. So just some background on the project overall. Uh, historically, the city's operated two wastewater treatment plants, one in West Fitchburg that handled the waste stream from the city's paper mill industry, um, which no longer exists, and as such, that plant is currently idle. And we have the East Wastewater Treatment Facility, which is located down near the airport, and handles the remainder of the city's wastewater stream. So as part of the wastewater treatment process, um, ultimately what's left over after we, we clean the wastewater are residuals. We refer to those residuals as biosolids. And historically, 
the city handled the management of those biosolids by incinerating them. We actually operated a regional incinerator that handled biosolids from adjacent communities. Um, and we produced income in doing so. Um, in 2012, that incinerator was taken offline due to tightening air quality restrictions. And since then, we've changed our wastewater treatment process to dry out those residuals and then dispose of them at the city's landfill. So that's problematic for a few reasons, but most not notably is that the city's landfill is nearing capacity. So we're left with uh, a project need. Um, our incinerator was, incinerator was taken offline. We're seeing rising costs in biosolids management, including increasing chemical costs, dewatering costs, trucking costs. We're facing the closure of our landfill within the next five to 10 years. Um, and that's just an estimate, uh, by no means hold me to that number. Um, we have a, an idle asset in the, the city's West Wastewater Treatment Facility. Um, and as we, we enter 2024, we have uh, increasing pressure from state and federal governments to meet certain renewable energy goals. Um, so those are the project needs that um, we're, we're trying to meet with this proposed project. So just some background on the action that we've taken to get to this point. Um, so in 2010, we began a residuals management study to figure out exactly how to handle these biosolids once the incinerator was closed. Um, that led us to consider the option of converting the West Wastewater Treatment Plant into an energy to organics to energy uh, uh, plant, essentially. So in 2013, we launched a study, a feasibility study, to identify whether that was economically and technically feasible to conduct such a, a project. Um, and as we finished that effort, we determined that the project was both technically and economically feasible, and we began pursuing that option. Um, around the same time, through a grant funded um, through the Mass CEC, we began conducting some public education and outreach. And up on the screen here, you can see a couple of the news articles that came out um, around that time frame in 2016. So since that um, feasibility study was concluded, we've pursued this project and we've developed certain project goals. And uh, Mark McNamara is gonna go over some of the, the specific goals and objectives of this project. <clears throat> some of the project goals and objectives for this is to repurpose the currently idle West Fitchburg Wastewater Treatment Facility that's been offline since 2010. It's um, good property. It was, it was designed for the paper mills at the time, which are not, no longer operating. So this location is ideal for this project. It's going to reduce costs associated with biosolids management and disposal. Right now we spend almost $450,000 a year in disposal costs, just in trucking fees for our sludge. Um, if the landfill happens to close, well, we know it's going to, those are going to go up. Um, substantially. A lot of cities and towns right now have problems getting rid of the biosolids. Wastewater treatment plants, they develop biosolids every day. And so eventually, they have to go somewhere. Um, so again, we're looking at diverting the biosolids away from landfill disposal, which they use um, to, to cap it and to fill it. Instead, we're gonna turn it into energy. It's gonna generate energy savings for the city, and it's also going to meet renewable energy goals. And also to generate a revenue stream as a regional provider of biosolids management. So that's some of the goals. Bottom line, we're hoping to provide a long-term, sustainable, self-sufficient solution for the city's biosolids. The, the management and also the disposal of them. Now this project has been going on for a number of years. It's um, incorporated a lot of administrations, a lot of people. Um, um, on, on the screen, you can see from the city of Fitchburg, we've had um, the chief procurement officer is, uh, began with Nancy Wilson, and it's currently being handled by Mary Delaney. Um, the commissioner of public works, it started with Lenny Lasco, then it went to Nicholas Bossonetto, and currently Nick Erickson is um, heading this up. The deputy commissioner of wastewater, uh, my predecessors, um, Joe Jordan was you know, way back in when this first started. Jeff Morosky was very instrumental in continuing this project. And I'm trying to keep this project going because I see it as a big benefit to the city. Executive Director of Community Development and Planning, um, Larry Casasa, Tom Skorowski, and Liz Murphy currently is heading it and they're working with us to get this project working. 
and also um, the mayor's office, you know, with Lisa Wong and currently Steve DiNatale. It's been a big help working with them to get this going. Outside professional services, um, we've had Ty and Bond do a residual management study. Western and Samson has done an organics to energy feasible study, feasibility study. Outside counsel, we have West Group Law overseeing for our behalf. And engineering consultant was with um, Comprehensive Environmental Incorporated. So this is what's been, these people and all these ones you see have been instrumental in trying to get this project going and continue going. So now Attorney Torres from West Group Law is gonna outline the procurement process that we've gone through to date. Uh, thank you very much, thank you Mr. Council President, uh, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Elect and Mr. Solicitor. The last time I presented on this project um, before you was just before the pandemic hit, just uh, before uh, there was a series of fits and starts and they, they didn't uh, deter but, but they may have slowed down a little bit the procurement process with, uh, with some of the remote workplaces that were going on. But we did get through a procurement process that complies with General Laws Chapter 30B. We began the procurement process as I presented to you last time with a request for expression of interest. The request for expression of interest in uh, the vernacular is really just an invitation to industry that says, here we are, we are the city of Fitchburg, here is the problem statements, biosolids, rising biosolids cost, here are our objectives, here are our current processes, here are our facilities, and then we ask industry to provide us with some suggested solutions, some suggested parameters for implementing those solutions, and some mechanisms and, and outcomes that we can expect, and then from that we were able to draft your request for proposals. The request for proposals is, is an open and competitive uh, procurement document. It uses best value and qualifications-based selection as opposed to low bid, because when you're dealing with technologies and technical processes and industry partners, you certainly want to make sure you qualify everybody. So under Massachusetts general law, there is a very specific provision of the general laws that applies to this type of facility. Uh, J Chapter 30B was amended to allow for the public-private partnerships of this type to work on biosolids and solid waste and other things. So there's a law that particularly applied to this and we were able to take advantage of that, that law for, for Fitchburg to use a very competitive process and then we were able to select, with the city was able to select, we were just advisors, the city was, was able to select RRE through an open and competitive uh, process and a conditional, a notice of conditional award was issued in February of this year. And then from that process, we began to work with the US EPA and the Mass DEP because to them, this was a very unique project and they hadn't permitted something like this before. There was some uncertainty at the EPA. There was some uncertainty at DEP on, on how to work that. There was no uncertainty for us. We walked them through it. We worked with, uh, with, with the, the DPW team and, and with, uh, with the Woodard and Current engineers to go ahead and develop a pathway that was correct. The way we wrote the, the pathway is, is what DEP and US EPA adopted, and that's what we'll be following going forward. So that put us back at the table with RRE to develop the contract documents that uh, um, uh, Mr. Erickson will talk about later as the next step. So that's where we are, that's how we arrived at this process, and then I turn it back to uh, uh, the commissioner. Thanks, Attorney Torres. Um, so ultimately what we're left with is a project to repurpose the city's idle West Wastewater Treatment Plant into a world-class regional renewable energy and biosolids management facility at zero capital cost and zero technical and operational risk to the city. Um, so up on the screen here, you can see on the top is the current state of the West Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, and just below that is a rendering of what this facility is anticipated to look like um, once it's completed. Um, so as I mentioned before, I have Tom Bintz here with me. He's the CEO of Rollstone Renewable Energy, abbreviated as RRE subsequently in this presentation. And he'll speak a little bit about um, his team, their qualifications, and the process they're proposing for this plant. <clears throat> Thanks, Nick. Appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about this project. Uh, I'm CEO of EQ Renewables, which is a developer, and Rollstone Renewable Energy will be the special service entity that the, the, the project will fall under. Uh, EQ Renewables was uh, formed by Canby Inc. Uh, to deliver P3 opportunities in the North American market, uh, allowing uh, people access to their proprietary technology 
in smaller communities as opposed to these big uh, municipalities that we typically do projects for. Currently in the, in the U.S., we have six operating plants, and we have 11, 11 uh, currently in design. Some of the largest cities include D.C. Water, San Francisco, uh, Dallas, which is the Trinity River Authority, uh, currently uh, have uh, Canby systems going in. And then we also have a few smaller cities, which doesn't happen as often, which is Medina, Ohio, and uh, Pontiac, uh, Michigan. I added something to the side. I'm not going to go through everything, but this is basically Canby's worldwide numbers uh, for information purposes. And I also put a little thing in there on uh, D.C. Water. D.C. Water, uh, which is the second largest wastewater treatment plant in the United States, was the first uh, municipality to uh, actually put the technology in uh, North America. Uh, they've been currently operating for about seven years. Uh, the, the process uh, that we put in uh, reduced their volume by more than 50 uh, percent. Uh, it gave them a high-quality uh, product that's uh, uh, on a soil amendment. They also bag some of it and sell at retail. Uh, they generate 13 uh, megawatts of uh, clean energy that they use at their plant for operations. Uh, it uh, cut their greenhouse gas emissions dramatically, and they're saving millions of dollars a year in, uh, in uh, management of their uh, biosolids. Uh, in addition to uh, EQ, uh, we also have on our team uh, Synergro Technologies, which is the leader in biosolids management and facility operations in North Burlington. Uh, Andrew Bossinger is here uh, representing uh, uh, Synegro. They currently operate uh, 60 plants just in the Northeast alone, four of those plants being merchant facilities, which is important because this is a merchant facility and they do operate differently and there's different things that you have to deal with uh, bringing in materials from other communities. So how does Rollstone Renewable and our solution meet the city's objectives? The first is the city wanted a long-term uh, sustainable solution, uh, which we provide. And, and the word long-term sustainable is loosely used just because you create renewable energy or you create some renewables, that doesn't make you sustainable. What makes you sustainable is basically three things. You've got to be environmentally sustainable, you have to be economically sustainable, and socially sustainable for to really have a solution that works long term without any problems. And we meet all those objectives. We will be diverting biosolids away from landfills. We accept biosolids and we turn it into uh, renewable uh, soils, avoiding the, uh, the necessary the necessity of going to landfills with materials, or in this case in uh, the Northeast, a lot of things also still go to incinerators. Uh, so that will uh, that no longer happen. Uh, you, I don't want anyone to be confused. There could be uh, materials going to a landfill, but it's not going to a landfill as waste. Okay, landfills use daily cover uh, in their processes, and this material can be used as a daily cover. And that does not go against a landfill's uh, airspace. So uh, it's a good product for uh, landfills. Typically, they'll use soils or, uh, uh, to do that. Uh, we will also generate a revenue stream for the city. Uh, we will generate energy savings. So basically, the West plant right now uh, uses some electricity. It's operating as a pump station. And it also uses gas to uh, keep the building uh, warm in the winter times. All that energy we'll provide from our uh, processes. So that will be our liability in the future. Um, finally, uh, providing net positive externalities to the city and its businesses. This, is, uh, this will be uh, the first, it's, number one, it's a world-class uh, sustainable merchant facility, and it will be the first one in uh, North America. There are other facilities in North America, but they are not merchant facilities. And the ones that do, there are some that bring materials in from other plants, but there are plants that they operate. They're not coming from other municipalities. So there are, you know, municipalities out there that have multiple plants. They'll put one central plant in, and then they'll bring materials into that. So I don't want anyone, uh, any misconceptions on what we're doing. This right here is just a quick map that just shows the uh, 17 plants we have going in in North America. Uh, again, uh, that's uh, currently what's happening. As you can see, there's a lot going on in the Northeast. 
Uh, that's because that's where the costs are their highest. In, in addition, it should be noted that I'm really not aware of any new uh, digestion facilities that are going in in North America uh, that are not CAMBI THP facilities. So I wanted to just provide a, a quick video presentation, something that's really kind of simple that was put together by the city of Raleigh, who's putting in a uh, CAMBI process right now. So we'll just uh, show it. Are we not getting the volume? Videos Video. are always a problem with PowerPoint presentations. Imagine a greener and more sustainable community. Here at Raleigh Water, we're busy creating one. Our bioenergy recovery project is one example of how we're investing in critical infrastructure now in order to conserve energy and protect the environment in the future. Located at our Noose River Resource Recovery Facility, the project will change how we treat waste at our main treatment plant. We'll use cutting-edge technology to more sustainably manage biosolids residuals. And it will all begin in your home. With every flush, you will help generate clean energy. Let's take a look. When you in your house, pollutants travel through pipes to the Noose River Resource Recovery Facility. Solids are a byproduct of the wastewater treatment process. These solids are directed to the solids handling process. There, screens are used to separate solids from the liquid. The Bioenergy Project will use an advanced innovative pretreatment method called thermal hydrolysis process, or THP, to precondition and pasteurize the solids. Think of it as a giant pressure cooker that will essentially cook the sludge. The result? A nearly 50% reduction in biosolids. The solids that remain will be of higher quality and will be used as valuable soil conditioner on area, fields, and farms. And that's not all. The new process will also produce biogas. It's estimated this will help fuel up to 50 buses per day. Think of it as environmental innovation. Here at Raleigh Water, we are building the future with you in mind. Greener, more sustainable for generations to come. I hope that was a little helpful. So what, what's driving uh, this move to uh, the THP process? Uh, it's, pr it's pretty simple. Uh, we, we operate our digesters at uh, higher solids. So that means you have less trucks coming in uh, because you can bring it in a solid state rather than a liquid state. You have less digesters you need to, uh, to process the sludge, which makes it a much smaller footprint. We also generate about 30% more energy than you typically get from uh, normal digestion. Our facilities are energy independent, and we generate only marketable products, RNG and exception, exceptional quality soils. Uh, this reduces the uh, capital needs because we have less digesters that we need to build, and we have lower operating and maintenance costs for biosolids management because we don't have any waste to get rid of. We have things that actually generate revenue, which is RNG and, uh, and soils. And finally, we have a great reduction in greenhouse gas emissions because you're taking methane gas and turning it into natural gas or electricity. 
This is a uh, just a, a diagram of uh, what we're doing and the and the major uh, uh, processes. I'm not going to go through this in detail. We could be here for uh, an extended period of time. I gave you guys all a, a little sheet. You can take it home, look at it, and we can answer questions. But one of the things I wanted to note is we typically use about a quarter of the number of digesters you would nor normally use in digestion. So if you look at this 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 layout. If you use traditional digestion, you would have to take four times those, three more, three times more of those number of digesters, right? So instead of three, you would need 12. And you can see you wouldn't fit it in that footprint. So that's one of the advantages to doing it. The other thing I want you to note is all the technologies that we're using, they're all proven technologies, uh, state-of-the-art technologies. There's nothing here that is uh, not being used somewhere else in uh, North America. Uh, two plants that are doing digestion in uh, or similar uh, processes in uh, Massachusetts are Boston and um, uh, the other one is um, oh, what is it Haverhill no. oh, Lawrence Greater Lawrence apologize they're all doing digestion and creating renewable energy besides that nobody is doing anything in uh, in, the, in the marketplace So real quickly, some of the big overall uh, benefits to it. Uh, this aligns with uh, Governor Haley's uh, climate and environmental initiatives for renewable energy. We're going to uh, generate uh, basically 366,000 MMBTUs. And that, uh, in, when you take that and convert it into uh, uh, gallons, uh, equivalents uh, for, uh, for uh, gasoline, that would basically uh, run four four thousand nine hundred cars a year that would be fun. and then uh, we will also be generating renewable electricity approximately 800 kilowatts that's equal to 680 homes of uh, renewable electricity uh, so we also uh, with the group uh, we met with uh, melissa hoffer who's the climate czar for uh, for the mayor's office uh, we met with nick and crew we had them on a call went through the project with them just like we're going through uh, with you. Uh, she was very supportive of the project and has offered her uh, assistance if we need it as we go through uh, different processes. This also provides a big need uh, in the market uh, for biosolids disposal. So right now the city is disposing of its material at a landfill that is currently being uh, uh, transitioned out, which is happening a lot in the, in the marketplace. Uh, there's a lot of landfills that are going away and not many landfills uh, coming in. In Massachusetts, there's really zero outlets for uh, biosolids. So there, most of the biosolids in Massachusetts are being hauled out of state. And they're either going to landfills or they're going to incinerators, uh, none of which are of what uh, we would classify as uh, uh, environmentally friendly solutions. So it's becoming a big problem, and the other big problem is without any solutions in, uh, in Massachusetts, uh, and it's becoming a big problem in other states, uh, there is talk, it's not happening, there's talk about, you know, why are we taking sludge from other states, right, when we don't have room for our own uh, sludges. So there's a, there is the risk of, in the near future, of uh, being uh, limited to only options in your state and you don't have any. So if the state of Connecticut said you can't come to our state with the, into our incinerators anymore, that, that material has to go somewhere and you don't have any landfills that can take care of it. It is a huge problem that isn't being addressed and that's why the cost of biosolids disposal in this state's gone up about threefold over the last five years. So states are now paying about uh, $200 a wet ton to move materials, and it used to be about 70. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem. Uh, again, when you talk about this problem and you talk about biosolids, bio I mean, that, that, that's ratepayers. That's all costs that, run, that, are, that are used to provide water services, and you, you actually have people paying for that. And who's impacted by this the most? The people that are impacted most are people that are on fixed incomes, right, and don't have as much disposable income. 
So when you raise rates, it impacts them more than it impacts others. So addressing this and doing things that are more cost effective help the, um, the people with less income, which is something that we all care about. Uh, this is an opportunity for uh, MEPA and the Mass DEP to find more sustainable solutions for uh, the state. Uh, we also are, have some uh, excess capacity or backup capacity at our facility for uh, electric generation. So we are generating our own power, uh, but when you generate power, you have backup. So if a system goes down, you, you turn the other one on. That system that we have as backup can be turned on if the grid needs additional power for any reason. So you have places that go in blackouts because all of a sudden there's peaking needs. We could help meet those peaking needs. And I say we can do that. That's really up to the to the utility on whether they want to take us up on that opportunity. We are providing that opportunity for them. So I don't want to say it's going to happen because that's not our decision. I'm just saying we're making that available. Uh, the final thing is we will be generating uh, jobs, both construction and long-term uh, jobs in the marketplace. So more specifically, those are more broad things, but more specifically, let's talk about the benefits to the city, which is probably what people really care uh, more about here. This allows us to take an idle asset, which is the waste, West Wastewater Treatment Plant, or an underutilized asset, and to sort of turn it into something that can generate a revenue stream for the city. It also generates construction and, and long-term operating jobs for the city, and helps the city meet its, uh, uh, its own uh, renewable energy uh, goals. It will reduce the volumes of biosolids from the East Treatment Plant Facility going to the landfill, which is nearing its capacity. Uh, it also will reduce some operating costs at the wastewater treatment plant, because we'll be, be bringing the wastewater treatment plant's uh, sludge over in the liquid form, and therefore it will reduce the cost that they now incur in chemicals and, uh, and equipment and time into watering the material to create a higher solids material for a landfill. Uh, we also will provide an additional source of revenue for the city to reinvest in its water collection system and treatment systems while leaving, alleviating uh, burdens to the taxpayers for these costs. This will also provide the city an opportunity to negotiate some additional host community uh, benefits as we further go on in the negotiations of our, uh, of our contract. So as far as next steps for this project, um, immediately we'll begin negotiating some of the transactional documents with, with Tom and his team at RRE. Um, those include a project development agreement, final lease agreement, security and guarantee instruments, um, and then we'll need to work through the municipal approvals for those documents. Um, and that starts with the mayor's office, um, and then we'll come before you as, as the city council. Um, and concurrently with all that, um, Tom and his team will begin conducting um, their engineering design, coordinating and conducting their environmental review through MEPA, uh, and then conducting regulatory permitting through various federal, state, and municipal agencies. Um, and our goal here is to start construction in late 2024. So up on the screen here, you can see a, a photo on the top left of the existing West Wastewater Treatment Facility building. On the top right, you have um, essentially what's uh, projected to be produced by this process, that's the, the Canby soil. Um, and then the, the bottom, you have a, a process diagram for an anaerobic digestion facility. So up here on the screen, you have a, an overall project timeline. You can see that that engineering, air permitting, and uh, MEPA, environmental assessment, environmental justice review, are all happening concurrently throughout the year 2024. Um, and we're, we're anticipating to start construction late 2024 and extend through 2026. So Tom, you wanna to talk about public outreach and environmental justice? Sure, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's very important for uh, public outreach and environmental justice. Uh, we're committed to working with the city, uh, with the, uh, city and uh, the community uh, to make sure they're informed on what we're doing. It's a good thing. It's something that we're proud of, and we certainly uh, want to be open with everyone on what we're doing. Uh, we will be partnering with a, uh, a firm for the outreach to make sure that we uh, do it right. 
there'll be a proactive public outreach plan. The uh, plan is approved, approved by MEPA. MEPA reviews these plans to make sure that we uh, do everything that we're supposed to. Uh, there'll be educa education, communi communication, and uh, honesty are, are important when we do this stuff. Uh, you know, I, everyone uses the word transparency, but we really are going to be transparent. There's no reason not to be. This is a great project. It's what people are looking for. And it's a common sense project in the sense that uh, it doesn't rely on any subsidies or anything like that. And that's it. We, we're open to questions. All right. Um, <clears throat> before we go ahead with that, I just would like to ask that since we're not taking a vote on this this evening, uh, please keep any comments that aren't direct questions very brief. Um, but otherwise, I have first up, Councillor Kucher. Thank you very much. Um, seeing how the West Fitchburg um, uh, wastewater treatment plant is smack dab in the middle of my ward, I have a few questions. Sure. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the presentation. And from what I've heard, I'm very excited to hear that the long dormant uh, wastewater treatment plant would have some uh, viability. Uh, I used to work in a wastewater treatment plant working uh, through college. Um, and so when you say biosolids, I know exactly what you mean. And that's a nice word for saying something else. <laughs> um, my question is, is I get enough complaints from my ward residents in regards to uh, the odors coming from the, uh, the, the, the landfill as well as Griff paper. And when you say you're putting this into a pressure cooker and cooking it, what is the outcome for errant gas, problems, odors, smells? The last thing I need in my ward is more people complaining about how West Fitchburg stinks. Happy to answer that. Uh, the, the pressure cooker process uh, back actually helps reduce odors. But within the pressure cooker and through the digestion process until you get out of the digester, that's all airtight. There's no air emissions. Okay, you don't have air emissions until you uh, come out of the digester. And by then, you've treated the material to a level where there is really no, no, no uh, offensive odors. Everything has odors, but there's no offensive odors. So the real odors that you have or the potential odors you have is in the delivery of the sludge, the unloading of the sludge getting into the, uh, the silos before it gets into that system. Uh, with that, that's all enclosed, then there's state-of-the-art odor control technology to, uh, to treat the air. So, um, you know, it, it, it should be minimal. Uh, but there is, some, there is some sort of risk? Well, there's all, I would never say there's never any risk. I'm not going to sit here and say there, there couldn't be an event, but in normal day-to-day -day operations, there shouldn't be any, any odor issues. Council, one of the things we do in the um, in the uh, process of, of negotiating these contracts is we include in all of our contracts uh, odor guarantees and processes for addressing that, and we we uh, do the best with the vendor with best what we call best available technologies. We don't expect miracles, but with best available technologies, as, as Mr. Bince has just indicated, they'll be using. We're able to contain those odors to to mitigate any odors. As he said, we usually require that the uh, any tip floors or offloading be done in in uh, sealed bu buildings, that there be negative air pressure, and also that they come in in sealed containers. It won't be open trucks bringing sludge in. And what is your uh, projection? I know it's pretty early to have a projection, uh, but this is pretty close to the highway, but I still have residents that live close to the highway. What do you think the traffic would, uh, would yeah, be like with incoming yeah, I, sludge? I, I think it's about, again, there's, there's sludge will come in two ways. There'll be some coming in as cake, which will be in, in the, uh, the end dump trucks. Uh, I, I speculate that to be, or, or estimate it to be, be, maybe between 12 to 15 trucks a day uh, on, the, on, the, on that side of it. And then there's liquid tr trucks, which will be bringing in the liquid from the east plant. Uh, and uh, that's probably an equal number of trucks, probably about 12 trucks a day. These trucks will be coming in 24-7, so there'll be a lot of it be being done at night. And, uh, you know, we'll do our best to manage it so that it's not during peak hours or where it really creates conflict. There will also be a, a, 
a study done on, uh, on uh, the truck traffic uh, relative to, you know, when it comes under the, the bridge for the, uh, the rail. That was actually going to be my next and, question. And, thought, and, uh, and putting in something in there to uh, address that issue. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Green. <clears throat> Um, can you um, give any specifics on um, what the net positive extremities will be to, to the city of Fitchburg, what that means? Well, you, this will be a very visible uh, project to, uh, to, the, um, to the state in that it's uh, going to be the first uh, merchant facility built in, in Massachusetts in a long time to handle biosolids. And, uh, and in addition to that, you know, the fact that it generates these renewables, the renewable energy, renewable natural gas, and renewable electricity, which is all initiatives of the, of the state. So um, our community is going to be kind of the setting the gold standard on how other anaerobic facilities should and could be um, not only designed, but operated as certainly, well? Certainly for smaller uh, places where there are a lot of smaller uh, municipalities that can't afford to do one of these systems on their own. So big, big plants like D.C. and San Francisco and all these guys, they have lots of sludge, they have lots of money, they can build these things. San Francisco's spending $2 billion to put in one of these systems in, in California. Uh, the one that's going in uh, WSSC is probably $400 million. So small cities can't afford this, these kind of projects. And when you're in New England, that's what you have. You have a lot of small little towns and communities, not these big uh, wastewater treatment plants. So this will be the first one that allows uh, smaller plants to have access to this kind of technology. Um, is the Lowell or Lawrence facility, is that, I know that's not one of your facilities, but that one right now is a merchant facility merchant facility as well, right? They, they, they take in product, they dry it, and then they allow the residents, they, they call it compost. You know, that's their finished product, is a compost bag of soil or compost. Yeah, that's I, their I don't believe Lowell does, because Lowell is looking at bringing materials to this facility. Lawrence. Um, Lawrence. Lawrence, Lawrence right. does. Uh, the Greater does Lawrence own, which Sanitary is a, which District. Is a, which is okay. a, a big... Uh, a large facility, they do uh, drying and digestion. Yep. Okay. Um, my last question will be, um, will we continue to um, treat the solids at the east plant, or is everything coming untreated from the east plant now to the west plant? Uh, I wouldn't say untreated. We're still going to have the wastewater treatment plant operated. We still treat the wastewater. But the byproduct, the, the sludge that's there, Right now, we dewater it. We run Fournier presses 16 hours a day, dewatering the sludge. Okay. And then that goes into a dumpster, which then goes to the landfill. With this process, we'll be just pumping it right into a tank, a tanker truck. And then we'll bring it up for disposal at the west plant. So we won't be running the Fournier presses. We won't be dewatering at the treatment plant. So it'll come right from the clarifiers right into a tanker truck. Okay. And what is the methane essentially is the byproduct of the digestion, correct? And that's, that's correct. what we're capping and then creating either our own, we're converting it then to a gas that we can use that's or correct. putting it back on the grid as electricity, correct? Yeah, so you get the methane gas that comes out of the digesters and then you have to condition that, that gas. <coughs> and you can, can condition it to run engines or you can condition it to go into the uh, pipeline. And you do different levels of conditioning to meet each one of those tasks. But we'll be doing some for renewable electricity, and the majority of it will be going as renewable natural gas. Will we, as a municipality, ever be able to tap into that? Will we ever be able to use what you're producing at that plant for our residents here in Fitchburg? The, that's, uh, that's a complicated uh, question because the way the grid operates makes that difficult because you've got to get a third-party uh, provider in there to wheel the, the electric to you. We've talked to them to figure out how to try and do that. I'm not sure we've come away of, of doing it. 
would would your company or your <coughs> yeah would your company be the wheelhouse then to have those connections and say hey we've got a great product here we we can't be a, we, a wheeler you have to be approved by a utility yeah. and you have to meet a whole bunch of requirements to be able to uh, wheel gas okay or wheel electricity thank you i appreciate this i've been on board with um anaerobic digestion for years now so i'm happy to finally see it coming before us again with some real I don't want to say teeth in the game, but <laughs> some real teeth in the game with this. So thank you. Sure. Thank you. Vice President Van, Has Van Hasinga. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so what is the, the estimated cost to develop this type of facility on, on this scale? Uh, a, fa a facility done in a typical uh, design build uh, scenario that a city does, uh, one that we're putting in would probably be Two hundred and seventy million dollars. So this would be a two hundred seventy million dollar investment to, to get this running and off the ground under our normal city procurement process. Yes. Now, um, is this something that the city would issue debt to to pay for, or would this be done through RRE? It's fully funded by us. Okay. There is no uh, capital required of the of the city. Uh, we fund it. Uh, we're taking city city volume in and other people to, to basically pay for it. Okay, so uh, just to add to that too, we explored a uh, public financing option mm -hmm. um, and just through going through a, a few different scenarios and options after receiving responses from the RFEI, that's, that's when we decided to go with a, a private, um, private funding for it. Which makes sense because I mean, $270 million is beyond our capacity. Well, the, the other thing to note is that there are incentives out there, which mm -hmm. is the timeline is very important. There are significant incentives out there through the Inflation Reduction Act uh, that a private company like us can take advantage of. So I know there are a lot of specifics to work out in the specific agreements that the, the city would reach with, with the firm, um, but what is the, the broad stroke of how this would be arranged? Would it be a, a lease to RRE who would then develop the facility with an annual payment to the, the city? Would it depend on the sort of tipping fees of outside communities? Would we have an allotment of, of sludge that we can bring in? How, how would those that? Yeah, oh, cur cur it? currently it's structured, or that we're talking, it's not finalized yet, right? With that there would be a lease payment paid to use your facility. Okay. Uh, that gets you a guaranteed uh, you know, stream of revenues for that. There's also a fee for all, all the tons that are coming into the facility. Mm -hmm. So you get a few bucks for every ton that we bring in. And then uh, we uh, also have a, a rate for the city, a discounted rate for the city to bring their sludge into the facility okay. that they would be paying to us. And then that, so in order to make it calculate it all together and it comes make up with it financially a viable um, for our RRE's part that you would be, you would be collecting some fees from the city at a reduced rate and also collecting fees from other communities that bring their sludge. And then that get, that'll get transferred to the city. That would pay for the construction of the facility, for its operation, then also an annual lease payment exactly. for the use of the property. Yeah, you're, it's just like you're taking it to a landfill, you're taking it to us. Yep. And um, what would be the capacity of, of the facility um, beyond just Fitchburg? Is this something that could do Fitchburg and the surrounding towns? Could it do, you know, What's yeah, there in addition to um, how, how much can it I'll, gi I'll give you the order of magnitude. I think the city here is about eight dry tons. I'm not exactly sure, but about eight dry tons uh, uh, a day. The facility will be bringing in an average of 84 dry tons a day. Uh, and uh, the capacity is probably 95 dry tons a day. Okay. Uh, so, you know, for peaks and valleys, timing and all that other stuff. So the majority would be coming from outside the city. The majority so, is coming so from outside. this is a potential moneymaker for, for it, taking all this It is. Process. So one, one thing to note, though, is that you guys did run a, a merchant facility before at your incinerator. Mm -hmm. And when you were running that incinerator, you were only bringing in liquids. We're bringing in cake. That's one of the advantages to this candy process. So you were probably bringing in almost an equal number of trucks, maybe a few less, but not near the volume. So it's, it's almost like a, a tenfold. Okay. You need 10 trucks, uh, tankers, to equal one of a cake, uh, one cake load coming in. So when, when you're bringing in cake from other communities, would they already go through the dewatering process? Yes. Through a similar canby process? Or no, just no, it's just normal cake process that they, they do to, before they send it to a landfill or an incinerator. Okay. 
So there's an advantage for moving that dewatering process from our east plant to, to have it done here instead, even if it's extra trucking to bring the... Yeah, I don't think you have the space at the at your current operating plant. I, that, I would love, love to have done it there because then if we created electricity, we could have given it right to your plant. Okay. Right, but that, that process, that drying process, as, as Mark mentioned, um, it runs 16 hours a day. There's heavy machinery that needs to be operated, so there's energy cost. There's chemical cost to, to be able to properly dewater. Then it goes into a dumpster, and we're still paying to truck it to the landfill. And in addition, we're paying that disposal fee at the landfill. So by eliminating that drying process and moving it all to this facility, we're, we're saving operationally. Mm -hmm. and the final thing to note is that, you know, we bring in the solids, but this stuff is, is really too solid with what we're bringing in. And the reason we're doing some liquids and we're taking it from the east plant is to dilute it down to the level that we need it. And uh, so that's allowing us to control a lot of the liquid trucks because pre pre predominantly they're going to be coming from the city of Fitchburg. And we can run those trucks when we need to run those trucks. Okay. So we'll be able to control traffic a little bit better as, as you... Uh, as you asked. And you mentioned that there is um, a permitting process to go through with the, with the state, MEPA, and... Yes. Uh, you mentioned <laughs> that, that there is um, some inexperience with this, this type of facility at the state level. Are there substantial risks for permitting to, to get this through, or, or is the state, by and large, receptive, even if they're still learning about it? So we had to go through um, quite an effort to make sure that the state and the federal governments were both on board with what we were proposing and that there was a viable permitting pathway. Okay. Um, we were hoping to be in front of you giving you this presentation about a year ago, and it's, it's taken a little bit of extra time to make sure that there is a viable permitting pathway and all the, all the stakeholders are comfortable with it. Um, as Tom said, it, it hasn't been done in the state yet, so there's, there's no regulation specific to this type of facility. Mm -hmm. So we had to make sure that we got the appropriate buy-in from DEP and EPA um, to, to make sure that this is a viable project. Because otherwise, you know, at $270 million, Tom's not going to want to build a facility that ultimately <laughs> doesn't get, get permitted. So. so we still have to jump through the hoops, but we have confirmed that the hoops are there and ready for us. Correct. So. It, was, it was a big hoop. With. And, and, and be honest with you, uh, I think there was uh, some help from uh, up above with the uh, governor's office to help it get it done, because they were very, very uh, uh, resistant early on. So I think it's it's a long-term solution that, other, like you mentioned, other communities are, are looking for as well for all of our, our waste that we, we can't ship it everywhere, ship it across the country in rail cars anymore. It's we have to figure out what to do with it. So. It's yeah, it's, it's, to me, it's important to note, and I always talk about this, is, you know, that sludge is coming in. 50% of that solids that's going to a landfill, 50% of that uh, volume is being converted into energy. Mm -hmm. That would normally fill and go into a landfill, no matter what you do, because people in Massachusetts don't have the space. This is, you know, old, old facilities. They don't have space, and they, they don't have digestion. Thank you. Council Squalia. Thank you. So um, the total capacity uh, per week of the facility is 95 dry tons. A day. Approximately. A day. Oh, a day. A day. Okay, 95 dry tons. And Fitchburg is supplying uh, like 12 uh, or 8 dry about tons. But, I, I think it's about But that's eight. the equivalent of 12 wet um, tra tanker trucks. Something well, they're like co it's coming in liquid. So uh, that's why there's so many trucks for the, uh, the material coming in from uh, Fitchburg. Right. For the, all the other material coming in, besides some others coming in liquid, uh, there's an equal number of trucks. But that's the other 76 tri-tons of material. That's right. the difference between liquids and solids. So do you need like 10% wet, uh, wet compared to dry or? So the mater um, typically materials from uh, from uh, solids, from wastewater treatment plants, is somewhere around 22%. And when we bring, put it into the Canby system, we designed it at about 16% solids. So the, the liquid that we get from, uh, from Fitchburg is, un, is, a, is about the right amount of liquid to, to make that uh, conversion. 
So predominantly the, the wet that you take in will be Fitchburg. Yes, and then potentially some other. Yeah, and there's other needs for liquid type materials for cooling and stuff like that, uh, that we might bring other liquid material in so we don't have to use any water. We can use liquid sludge and using water, which is much more efficient. And the, um, so the, as a merchant facility, have you identified potential uh, merchant partners? Like I know Gardner was trying to build a sludge landfill, but yeah, we, again, the, uh, the important thing or what we look for is, again, the, uh, went to the bigger ones, a lot of small plants, but we went to the bigger ones. And uh, basically, uh, the big ones are Lowell, uh, South Essex, uh, uh, who are both very interested in coming in. Uh, and then, uh, I'm going to say it wrong, Haver, Haverhill. 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 See? Haverhill. I can't talk, I got to get it straight before I talk to them again uh, <laughs> to, get, to, get, to get the names right. And um, there was a fourth, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's four uh, large ones that. Uh, four large, large municipal ones. partners that you've identified? Yeah, because it's a lot easier to not deal with, a, you know, hundreds of municipalities. So four major ones and then some other ones to bring in. And, and Gardner is, uh, I'm not sure they're willingly interested. <laughs> <laughs> but because uh, they take theirs right now to uh, their own little monofill that may be being shut down. So uh, they prefer to do that than, than uh, you know, than to come here. But uh, uh, there is a possibility they will be coming here. Okay. And for the, um, you have the um, biogas um, upgraded, uh, methane scrubbed, conditioned, and injected in a nearby pipeline um, is will there be um, some sort of tank storage system? Is the pipeline? Are you building a pipeline to connect to a nearby pipeline? Uh, pipeline How does that is, work? Yeah, the pipeline is actually there. There's, a, there's already an existing. There's an existing line. Trying to feed back into the uh, system. Uh, probably the bigger use, biggest user of gas is the uh, the paper mill, which is right next door. So there is a line going to the paper mill. There's a line going into our facility. Uh, it'll be going into that line. So there'll be an interconnection into that line. Is that something that uh, you can back back feed into, um, or how does that? Yeah, to, well, you got to get it to the right pressure, and it just goes in, and it works off with pressure differentials. So and, you have like a net uh, meter. Yeah, net meter, kind of like that. We're, it's really kind of complicated, but we are going into the pipeline, and then uh, as a renewable, and then we're actually going to buy some of the gas back to create more electricity, and it and it's. It's really about monetizing renewable credits and, and the value you can get for doing that. So uh, we're putting in uh, renewable gas that can be used for truck, predominantly used for trucking. And then we're going to buy really our gas back, but it's not renewable anymore because we sold those credits to somebody else. And we're going to put that into CHP engines, which are renewable because of the efficiency you get, because when we create the power, when you're, run, when you're creating electricity, typically you're getting about um, between 35 and 42 percent efficiency on the BTUs and the BTU of electricity that you get. Um, but you also create one of your byproducts of CHP is heat. And we're going to be using that heat that comes off of those CHP engines to get an efficiency closer to about 70 percent by using that heat to, uh, in our processes to dry some of the sludge to create our product. So the, the, uh, the gas goes in renewable, we buy kind of unrenewable gas back, but then we create renewable energy by using waste heat. <laughs> and that's eligible for credits too. It's, it's, it's crazy stuff. I love be it. Honest. I love it. The, um, so the existing pipeline infrastructure and um, you know, the amount of methane that you intend to create um, do you anticipate any additional need for uh, storage of this gas other than, um, you know, uh, injecting it directly into the pipeline? No, it'll, it'll all go in. Uh, I will say this, Unitel has been great. Uh, don't say that about a lot of utilities, but they've been great, very helpful. They've assigned somebody to specifically do this. Uh, they've talked about doing some things that are very positive for us, kind of like doing a net metering. Uh, because we will have excess at times. Uh, they'll buy that gas for us at market rates. Um, I think they're going to allow us to, to almost net meter on the electric side of things because it's renewable. 
which will maybe help us be able to wheel some to the city. So I'm not sure, sure exactly how to do that. You're contracted <coughs> with other people for electricity, so it's, it's, it's kind of complicated, but uh, we'll do our best to be able to allow you to make the claim you're using your, your electricity. And finally, for the, um, for the lease deal with the city, is this like a 99-year lease or um, a 30-year, or what's the term, the length of Thir that? 30, tip, I think we're looking at about 30 years, maybe 25 years with five-year renewals or something well, along those lines. Councilor, um, we'll be determining that in the uh, lease negotiations with them, with your office. Yep. So that framework will be decided on our end of it, and then we'll present it over to RRE. So those, those internal negotiations have to take place first um, before we um, you know, offer over to RRE a term of years and renewals. Thank you. All right, thank you. Councilor Cragen. I, I have no voice. I'm, I've, asked, I've asked my colleague to read. So Councilor Cragen has written I'm sure you have mapped this out, but will there be sufficient space and real estate for the technology and construction if growth in this system comes to pass? Yeah, the, the little handout we showed is a layout of the, of the facility <coughs> and where everything is. Uh, and again, you have a handout that, that'll explain it all. But uh, yeah, there's sufficient space. But as, as we said before, without the technologies we're putting in there, you, you couldn't do it you would need uh, you know, more than double that space using normal, traditional digestion. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Councilor Boschman. Yeah. <clears throat> first of all, I'm all in favor of this. Well, you don't have to worry about that part of it. <laughs> now, this, that first thing I want to ask you, though, when I first came on board, when I first became a city council, we went to a meeting. I think that young man over there was there, too, with the Western uh, what was that? Sometimes. Sometimes. They talked about having generators. Are you going to have generators up there, diesel generators to generate energy? Uh, not diesel. Uh, they are gas-operated, natural gas-operated uh, CHP units, they call them. Oh, uh, combined heat and power, uh, basically, that generates electricity and heat, and uh, that creates the overall efficiency. We will be using the electricity at our plant. Any extra will pass along. And then on the, uh, on the uh, heat side of it that comes off that CHP, we use it in our process to dry the sludge. Okay. My question to you is this. Maybe Mark can answer it. I, I believe we pumped the waste from the West Pittsburgh plant all the way down to the east. Don't we pump it? So we, and we, why aren't we pumping it our waste, turn it around and pump it up? If you're going to generate electricity and gas, all you need is pumps to bring it up the hill instead of having all kinds of trucks. So right now, the, um, the Grief paper mill, their, uh, their waste stream flows by gravity down into the West plant as if it was still operational. Um, but we don't operate the actual treatment plant. All we do from there is pump it into the trunk sewer. Um, so it's, it's not pumping it in the sense that it's pumping it all the way down across the city to the east plant. It's just pumping it into the gravity sewer that's already on that same site. And then from there, it flows by gravity through the center of the city, um, along the river, by the airport, and then makes its way down to the, the east plant. Um, so right now, we're, we're still in the early stages of trying to figure out all the fine details. And once we negotiate all these contract documents, we'll really get into it. Um, but there's, there's some co-benefits that we could realize by um, incorporating some operations specific to that paper mill to avoid pumping costs, um, provide some backup generation, <coughs> et cetera. So there, there's still some details there that we want to hash out and make sure that, you know, we're partnering with that, that paper mill as well as RRE to make it, um, make it a, an attractive option for them as well. Yeah, that, uh, that pipeline from the, from the pump station to your wastewater treatment plant, uh, we're not taking that level of untreated sludge. So in other words, the, the sludge that goes through the pump station still has to be treated before it comes to our facility through a wastewater treatment plant. We're taking the, the, the end solids out of a wastewater treatment plant and, and doing what we do. So that, that line is not going to become available. It's still going to be operating as a pump station there. Now, when I, 
Councilor Green and I, and there was a couple other councilors that went to on that tour down at Lawrence, Mass. If I'm not mistaken, maybe you can rectify that. I think you, you were there, Mark, with us too. When I went with uh, Jeff, we went with Jeff, a big bus, bus of us, a bunch of us people. Are we going to take garbage too, or are you just doing human waste? Any garbage? Like from the restaurants and uh, no. the market basket and that? No? None of that at all? No. Because they did. They took, they took garbage, if I'm not mistaken. Right, Amy? Yep. They took garbage too. Yeah, you, you, can, you can take garbage, clean it, and, uh, and process it in a digester. It has a lot of energy. Uh, problem with that is it, it generates a lot of contamination and it generates a lot of odors and, and a lot of other issues. Um, and, it, and garbage really, to be honest, has a, has a relatively low fee to accept, okay? So whereas biosolids, as I told you before, has a relatively big number uh, to receive uh, as in, in finances to support the project. So we're much better off bringing in uh, biosolids and with the need here, and there's plenty of people that'll bring us materials rather than bringing in uh, garbage and food waste. And in addition to that technical answer, this plant will not be permitted to take um, municipal solid waste or any form of solid waste under the solid waste regulations. It's uh, going to be strictly, uh, you know, residuals from water, wastewater treatment processes. And then that, organic, that, that's true too. Lim and limited organics that are allowed under the regulations, but not the type of waste that would qualify under the municipal solid waste regulations and the site assignment that you're all familiar with from your own landfill. Right. Well, I'm not that familiar because I'm not a lawyer. Some of this stuff is over my head. <laughs> uh, what about, uh, we're going to take in different communities. What about, you hear so much about PFAB. Is that going to have a big major impact in the city of Fitchwick if we're taking yeah so site yes. PFAB. so we we will be we will be putting in so uh, we'll be bringing other people's sludge and obviously that sludge all sludges have uh, some form of PFAS in it and so when we do all the things we're doing there is a discharge that'll come off of our plant and there'll be a, a discharge agreement between us and, and the city on what we provide them and um, we will be putting in a, uh, uh, a treatment to remove uh, PFAS prior to going to your plant. Probably something that uh, ultimately other uh, uh, companies, manufacturers that discharge into your, uh, into your sewer lines will eventually have to do themselves. Uh, so we'll actually be the first ones on your line to do it. Uh, but we will be putting in something to remove PFAS before it comes to your plant. It's not all removed, but substantial amount of it is. Okay. Now, according to your chart, what I've been reading, I did read sure. it. Uh, you, you're going to start construction. You, you're hoping to be finished by the year 2026. Correct. Will you give me your word? You hire no, nobody but fits for residents, residents only if they qualify and good paying jobs when you hire, when you start hiring? Um, again, it, it depends on skill levels. I can't sit here and tell you. Maybe uh, Andrew could probably answer that better than me because Synergro is going to run the operations of the uh, of the facility. Um, Certainly, city residents of the city of Fitchburg would give first priority for all hiring of, of, of long-term jobs, yes. And then you have wages that are going to be up there and substantial in that $15 an hour, but better? These are very competitive environmental sustainable positions. They're fifteen dollars and, and significantly higher for very skilled positions. These are skilled positions running a high technology energy production facility. Yes. And then my final question, because I thought I was reading things when I was reading your booklet that you passed out to me, and I thought I read in there that since it's Christmas season and you're here to talk to us, there was something in there saying that we're going to generate enough power to supply all the lights in the city of Fitchery at no cost to the residents. <laughs> Is that true? Uh, well, it depends on how uh, big of a lease payment we make to you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put that on the table, certainly, Councilor. <laughs> but one other thing, though, before I forget, because I'll talk to you. You talked about you're going to generate enough power, and you're hoping to give it back. Are you sure you're going to try to give it back to Unitil? Because I, if I'm not mistaken, but I could be wrong, the... Uh, yeah, well, uh, the landfill generates gas, and it generates electricity, and I believe they sell 
their power to the highest bidder on the open market. I believe, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure, because it's what I heard from some people, yeah. that they go to the open market to get the most money. Are you going to do that, or are you going to try to go right with Unitel since they've been going backwards for you? Yeah, it's so... Look, we're always trying to get the greatest value. The thing to note is that the majority of power that we generate is going to be used by us. Uh, so what you do is you, you basically have intermittent power, intermittent excess power. So to, I really can't market that to anyone because I don't know if I'm going to have it or not. When, when waste management creates electricity, they create a lot, and they know they're going to have X number of kilowatts to sell. I don't know, given any given day, if I'm going to have excess or not excess electricity to sell to the grid. So there, that's a hard thing to uh, to market. So uh, Unitel really is the is the best option to do it. And if they'll do it in a net metering, mm -hmm. nobody can make that offer to us. And then the final thing, and I promise you that, is uh, <laughs> when you make the uh, compost. And you're selling up. You're going to go to Home Depot and Lowe's to try to sell your product. No, to, to be to be honest with you, I mean, you can do that. Uh, that's a, yet another step in a, in a lot of liability in creating products that you sell retail. You got to get a whole bunch of, uh, uh, you know, go through a lot of hoops to get permission to do that. Uh, what we're what we're probably going to be doing is uh, sending it to a soil amender that'll take our product. Uh, mix it with sand and create soils that are used uh, um, by the general public for, you know, construction and stuff like that, road projects, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, okay. All right, then. Thanks. So it'll probably go to a soil blender. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Councilor Giantelli. So it was stated earlier about what's got the best value. These proposals that we get sound phenomenal. But there's one thing that's always missing in all these things. What are we getting for it? Waste management takes us through the ringer. They make a ton, and we get crumbs. And then they say to us, well, if it weren't for us, as if it's an act of charity, <laughs> you'd be paying $3 million to pick up the recycling. Oh, well. So the city bends over backwards and lets them take us to the woodshed with that moniker in mind. So now we're in a forever lease with them, and we can't see what they're making off of us. They won't share it, obviously. Why won't they share it? Because they don't want us to know what they're making, because they know they're making out like bandits. Then you have the ambulance company. It's been $500,000 for like 20 years now. They're not making, they're not making, they're making more than 500000 or else they wouldn't do business here because they're a private company. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at Ms. Delaney. Everybody on the city side advocating for us. This is a private company that's in it to make money. And they wouldn't be going here if there wasn't buco bucks for them. And after what I've heard tonight about how it's, you know, first in the state, the DEP doesn't even know about it, much about it, they're not putting $200 million into this city without getting a return on investment. And I'd love to know what the payback ratio is on that investment. To put that kind of money in means there is a lucrative revenue stream for them on the other end. This sounds a lot like waste management, where landfills are dying and other communities are utilizing our landfill to waste management's benefit, not ours. So I want it made clear tonight and for the mayor elect as well. Don't let these guys sell us on, well, the facility's vacant, it'll add jobs, it's good for the environment. Wonderful. Where's the money? I want the money because they have to see value in investing in here. We better get our piece of the pie and not crumbs. I want slices, and I'm a big guy. I don't eat crumbs, okay? And I want that on the record tonight, because I don't want to sound like I'm attacking this company. I'm just saying, these guys are in it to make money. I'm in the private sector. I get it. It's not against anything like that. I want our cut, and I don't want a sliver. 
It, okay? And I just want to make that clear to everybody on the negotiating side. Do not give this away. Because there's two examples now where we've taken it. And then we're told by those who negotiate those contracts, we should be grateful. I'd be grateful if I saw what their financials were. Because if they're still doing business with us, they're making out. To what? And we're not seeing enough. So I want to make sure in these negotiations, we get our piece of the pie for the benefit of our taxpayers. Now, is this money staying with the wastewater facility enterprise fund? Is that where this revenue is going to go? Right. It'll stay with the, the wastewater enterprise fund. So it's a, a wastewater enterprise fund owned asset in the, the West Wastewater Treatment Plant. So by leasing it out and generating that revenue, it stays with that enterprise. Even better. And why do I see even better? Because what, what are our residents taking on the chin right now from wastewater? The sewer separation project by the very same agencies that don't know anything about what we're talking about here. They don't know much about much anyway. All right. For starters, they said our residents are flush with cash and can avoid fees. Counselor. So Counselor. I would like you guys. Counselor. Can I just ask that, like I said, that we keep it almost exclusively to questions just because we, this is going to come before us again in the future for actual voting? I, I will. Okay, count, Mr. President, I'll just, let me just, I've just got one more final thing here about that. Our residents are paying a lot right now for wastewater service, more than they can afford. If this revenue is going to that facility or that enterprise, we better see benefits on the rate side down the road once this albatross that the feds put on us is over in 2030. So that's my statement slash my questions were answered. My statement is think of beyond 2060. Mm -hmm. All right, because these guys are going to get a lot. That's why they're coming here. We better get a lot too. Thank you. Council President, I'll just address that, that question, and that's a perfect question, a perfect expectation. And the way we frame the RFP and the price proposals is so that there is a number of different opportunities for the city to realize economic benefits. And when we go to the, the negotiation table, I, I can assure you we're going to be mindful of how much money is in the deal. I always say there's a pie, and there's enough of that pie for the municipality to share, for the um, private industry to share, and we make sure we maximize our benefit there. There are a number of items, lease, lease payment, reduced uh, tip fee for our sludge that goes into the plant, host community benefits on the sludge that comes into the plant from the merchant facility. So when we come and we take sludge from other uh, municipalities uh, like Lowell, for example, Haverhill, um, those will come in through the city. The benefit of that is they come in through a municipal agreement so those communities don't have to go out to bid for this lunch. They sign an agreement with the city. That's host community revenue that we're bringing in. We'll ask for a percentage of that. There are things called environmental attributes, which are the benefits for the RINs, the uh, Re Renewable National Gas Credits. We'll ask for a percentage of that. We certainly will make sure that the city is, is getting a representational and a fair share of this while they're allowed to have the share that they need for their shareholders to privately finance this and not put it on the, on the public burden. Um, as far as the waste management contract, I've sat across the table from waste management. Uh, Totten has the largest uh, tip fee with waste management anywhere, not in the state, but in the country. Um, we've sat with some of the, my partners and I've sat across the table from some of the biggest energy and environmental and water com companies in the world. As, as Tom and Andrew know, and we always make sure we get the municipality's fair share. That's what we're there to do. We're, we're there to protect the public fisc. All of us come from government, um, just like you, and, and we're here to look out for your interest. We won't make the deal break. We won't do that because that's irresponsible. We'll make sure we get you your share, and, and we've been around the block enough to know when that breaking point is and get you as much as we can without sending these oh, guys home packing. Oh, yeah, so, I don't, I don't and, want to And they've been very to fair to deal them. with. <laughs> they're fair to deal with. I know both of these gentlemen from the industry, and, you know, both of their companies that are, that are behind them are all companies that, that we can reasonably deal with, and I don't expect them to be like one energy company I was sitting across the table with like this who remain nameless, and uh, I was asking for certain guarantees and they said, well, we're the largest, we're so-and-so. And I said, Enron was big, too. 
That was point number one. Then when they wouldn't come to our price point and they just kept going around in circles and presenting the same thing, I asked them all to leave the room for a moment and they said, do you need to caucus? I said, no, I'm just going to sit here and negotiate against myself for a little while and see how that works out. They got the point and they came to the price. So there's always, there's always a way to get to here and we're certainly going to help you guys get there and I know they'll, they'll, they'll be a good partner and, and they heard you so they know. They, they don't need me now. You, they heard you and they know. Well, I'm confident sure in your ability deal. and obviously our chief procurement officer and every, some of these deals are made long before their time and I'm oh, glad oh, to hear exactly. that. I'm not advocating we toward, do anything to, to jeopardize it. And I don't want to sound like I'm critical to this private industry. I am very happy they want to invest their dollars in our community. Absolutely. I just want to make sure that we do it right up front and we're not left holding the bag on missed, missed revenues that we could have gotten. I just like it to be a little bit equitable, little bit, as opposed to 80, you know what I mean? So far away, we are providing this opportunity with, with our real estate. And so I'm, I'm pleased to hear that's, that's the way you're going with this, great. And when we actually get the, the details, hopefully when a contract is ironed out, we can discuss much further the financials at that point, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Cruz. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited by this, this up to $300 million investment back into our city. I'm eager to see how it works out. My colleagues have asked most of the kind of financial questions that I had and the particulars and how that will eventually work out. So I'm, I'm eager to see that, uh, like my, my colleagues as well. Uh, I just have w one quick question um, to add to that. You've got 67 operational Canby does uh, plants currently right now nationwide, is that? Uh, yeah. And we talked a little bit about sort of contamination and accidents. Have we seen anything of that nature or, if, you know, mistakes have happened? We're talking about pressurized gas. Are there ever any, is there spillage? Have we required cleanup? What, what sort of contingencies do we have in place? No, I'm, I'm not really aware of any, uh, any issues with the, with the THP process. Uh, one of the things that we're really most proud of is that every uh, system that's put, been put in and it's been out there for 30 years is still operating today. So there's, there's no facilities that are uh, non-operational, and I don't think there's many technologies that can say that. Mm -hmm. And never any sort of environmental mishaps or, you know, no. lack of a better word, disaster or anything that required? Not, not that I'm aware of. A lot of them are in Europe, so I can't say. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, that's unique that, that I, look, this is, this is what I always tell people that I think is important. Uh, the United States is, is, a, is a bit unique in that we have all these uh, wastewater treatment plants and they're all independent, right? Um, and they're all run by municipalities. In, uh, in the Uni United Kingdom, they're run by private companies and they get almost like territories. And the, uh, uh, more than 50% of the volume in, your, in the UK is run through Canby systems. Another thing to note is that the uh, uh, when you're using these private companies, they have all these different territories. Uh, it allows to have repeat buyers. And we have a significant number of repeat buyers. Thames Waters bought seven or eight Canby systems uh, since their initial one that they, they, they purchased. And that's a testament to, to the process. They wouldn't be buying it again if it didn't work and they had problems with it. And, uh, you know, Veolia, which is, a, which is somewhat of a competitor with us, they were operating three Canby systems in Europe. Uh, and they had their own technology to compete with us at one time. So um, that, that's, that's really what I tell people. People wouldn't be buying it again if they didn't think it worked. You can't say that in the United States because there's not a lot of opportunity for people to repeat buy. But I will say that HRSD put one in uh, and it's been operating for, I think, three years now. And now they're looking at putting one in at, a, at another plant. Mm -hmm. So it works. Terrific. And we can anticipate um, very detailed financial, seeing a very detailed financial arrangement when it comes before us for an actual vote. That's what we can anticipate so that we can make sure to, some of the concerns of my colleagues are not realized. Yeah, yeah we're, 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 we're pretty much an open book. We, we've put in, uh, you know, the, uh, in our plan uh, profit sharing. I mean, a big source of our revenue is uh, renewables. I mean, it's a big number. Mm -hmm. And uh, those programs are volatile. Uh, they can be here today and gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, it just depends. And so, uh, you know, when you, do, when you have those kind of things, you, you have to share. You can't commit because you don't know what it's going to be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. 
So we have profit sharing in there, and then obviously we're profit sharing. We have to share the information with the, the city. So no issues with doing that whatsoever. It's a partnership. Terrific. Thank you. I yield the floor. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Schultz. Thank you, Council President Zarella. I, I guess uh, most of the questions have been, been answered. Uh, I, would just, uh, I was just wondering about the risk to the city. Uh, I mean, it, it, you know, this plant has been idle, but it's still used as a pumping station. And uh, I know you mentioned that uh, you're taking advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act to, to help with this project. Yeah. I'm just wondering if, you know, if the project got underway and then for some reason you just decided that you couldn't, uh, you couldn't finish the project. You know what would happen to the to the treatment plant? Would it still uh, revert back to its its former self? Uh, uh, you know, because we you know we have a we have a warehouse that just got built and it's not being used. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's you know yeah. this. We're not going to do anything that negatively impacts the current operations of the plant. We actually might do a few things that might put us at risk that would actually help. Uh, the facility. The building itself is not being utilized at all right now, right. except for the electrical, and, and that's, that's actually costing you because you got to heat it and maintain it and all that. So, uh, you know, one of the interim things we're still talking about uh, would be to kind of segregate the pump station from that building and put in generation and electric directly to that site. So that actually, if it didn't might happen, save us a few you would still have that and you would save in the long run, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the bigger risk is on us when I start hearing about these negotiations and, uh, you know, we're putting, we're going to be putting in $8 million over the next, uh, you know, six to eight months in permitting without everything necessarily being locked in. So we're, we're really at risk. <laughs> risk. Yeah. But if I don't do it, we're not going to meet the, the timetable that's set for the Inflation Reduction Act. What is the timetable for the? Well, the construction has to start by the, the 24th, uh, the, by December of 2024. Now, the definition of starting is, is may not what people think is for construction, but we have to have committed contracts of at least 10% of the project uh, by that time uh, for it to count. So, yeah, that's a big number. That's a big number. It's not being built without it. Thank you. I yield the sure. floor. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm very pleased with everything I'm hearing. Uh, you know, I think this is going to be good for the city going forward. Uh, once we iron out the details, I do have one quick question, just a clarification, um, because there was a little bit of talk about it, and it seems like people are working off two different definitions. When you said this would be the first merchant facility in North America, uh, and I know Councillor Green had mentioned there's another one already that sells its uh, soil or its bio product. Um, when you said this will be the first merchant facility, you were talking about taking in this, from this, other communities? This, this is the first mer merchant facility uh, uh, using THP technology. Gotcha. There's, so in other words, Cinegro operates, you know, four merchant facilities right now uh, in incineration and, and, and drying in, in, the, in the Northeast. So there's, there's lots of merchant facilities. There just aren't merchant facilities using this technology, and that is this screen, right? So uh, what you typically see uh, in merchant facilities not to offend my partner, <laughs> is <laughs> his incinerators, which are not what I would deem being green, or certainly doesn't have the perception of being green, and dryers. And you put in dryers, what are you doing? You're using energy to dry, and a lot of it. So what we're doing is we're generating energy, reducing the amount of material that would need to be dried, and then we're creating this high quality material that doesn't need to be dried so much to make uh, to make a product. So when one of the, again, just real quickly, uh, people dry typically to create a class A product. And the requirement is that you have to dry it to 90% to meet that quality. And that allows it to go anywhere once you do that. The issue with that is you probably over dry it, but you have to meet this regulatory requirement. Our product is class A coming out of that digester 
So we're not trying to meet class A, we're trying to create products, okay? And that's the key. Do I drive to this intent? Well, I might create this product, so I'll dry a little bit more. Oh, well, I'm creating this product, I dry a little bit less. If the world comes to an end and all this stuff has to go to a landfill for daily cover, then I'm gonna dry a lot more to reduce transportation costs. Mm -hmm. So the, that, that's where I say it's, it's really sustainable because we have all these other opportunities. And the final thing that we've done is, you know, there's only certain technologies out there that are really uh, acceptable and they're working. So I, you might have heard gasification and, you know, this place is looking to putting a gasifier. There's no gasifier or um, uh, paralysis system out there that's working solely on biosolids in the United States. Totally unproven. Now, that doesn't mean it's not gonna happen and it's, it, it might, might work, but what we've done is we've built space to be able to put something like in, that in. But if it does go in, it's gonna be half the size because we got rid of half of the, of the material doing the, uh, the digestion. And when you digest, you create a real high quality gas that can be used for pipeline and creating electricity. When you do gasification, the gas you create is a sin gas. It's a dirty gas. The only thing that can be used is to operate your dryer. I don't need it to operate my dryer because my dryers were working off a of waste heat from the CHP that's generating renewable electricity. So there's lots of things out there. It's very complicated. But in the end, we're, we're planned for all these things. But we're not going to put in a technology that isn't proven. It doesn't make any sense. All right. Thank you. That answers sure. my question. I see uh, Councillor Fleming. You've got your hand up. Yes, I do. I actually was trying to read a little bit um, about this. Some of the concerns that I'm seeing with um, with this process is um, air pollutants. Is that a concern or has that been um, perfected? So uh, air? The, the air emission, the, the CAMBI system, the CAMBI process has no air emissions. Uh, you have air emissions that are minors from a boiler that heats uh, water and creates steam. So when you're heating that, you have emissions. Uh, you also have uh, uh, air emissions on the CHPs, and there's very defined rules that you have to clean it up to a certain uh, level for uh, permitting. Uh, that's all being done, so the air emissions on, the, uh, on that is, is very minimal. Uh, where you hear people talking about air emissions problems or potential problems could be in the drying process. Uh, what we're doing is we're using a, uh, a dryer that does not generate a lot of air emissions. So our dryer is an indirect dryer, uh, not a, um, uh, a, a, a drum dryer that has a lot of airflow. So basically our dryer is gonna generate you know, maybe 150 to 200 CFF, CFM uh, in uh, air emissions, which is uh, kind of like a, a vent fan of an oven, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and uh, we will be putting a, a, a filter, a carbon filter to uh, treat that air uh, that, does get, uh, that does, does get emitted. And all that is regulated by uh, the, um, the Mass DEP and we'll meet all those regulations. But we've been very, caught, we've been very careful to, uh, to uh, use technologies that don't create a lot of emissions. Okay, one of the other things that I was reading as well is there are, there's a potential exposure to pathogens, disease-causing organisms that may oh. filter out. Yeah, actually uh, the CAMBI system uh, is, that's one of the benefits of it, is the reduced uh, pathogen reduction. So we basically, we don't pasteurize the sludge, we sterilize the sludge. We bring it to 340 uh, degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which basically destroys all bacteria. And then uh, because we break up the cellulosic structure of the sludges, uh, there's better digestion, and the better digestion uh, reduces odors and pathogens. So that's what uh, class, a class A product is. It's uh, meeting certain uh, requirements for uh, pathogen and vector attraction, and we exceed all those levels. Okay, so so one of the things that I'll, that, I, that I'll note that, that, that again, I, I like doing, uh, uh, 
doing some comparisons. So uh, DC Water, uh, which again is one of the largest uh, plants, uh, used to land apply its biosolids, and they would get over 100 complaints a year uh, from odors and, and problems with their, uh, with their sludges. Uh, since they put Canby in uh, over the last seven years, they've had two odor complaints. From 100, a, from 100 a year to two odor complaints, of which were unconfirmed. And they're putting this material down on uh, farms that are very close to uh, extremely expensive homes. So there's, there's, we're going to have a guarantee that none yeah, of we're not abs Absolutely. We, we're, we will guarantee the Class A uh, of the product. And there is okay. no regrowth either, which is, again, that's something you might hear. So basically, when you digest sludge or you do something with sludge and you kill these things, they'll regrow. So if they sit for a while, it rebuilds. And uh, we have uh, no regrowth with our product. Okay. And there's studies on all this. I, I want to know who's doing the studies. So, you know, sometimes oh, they're independent. They're not biased. being done by us, I can assure you. <laughs> Um, this is a much simpler question, um, sure. seeing as that even though the, the West Fitchburg plant is sort of isolated, there's still neighborhoods that abut that property. And you're talking about these trucks that will be coming in at night. Can you guarantee that there will not be um, more noise in that area than usual? I mean, some of those people are used to hearing some traffic, but where this is going to be adding, what do you say, like, 12 more trucks. In. Yeah, think, think, think about it, maybe a truck an hour. Okay, so how, how loud are these trucks? I mean, what is the increase in truck traffic compared to now? Because not only those people have to deal with the train, which eventually you get used to, now they're going to be dealing with more traffic. <coughs> and I myself live rural residential. But trust me, if there's more than normal traffic at 3 o'clock in the morning, I can hear it where I am. Yeah. So these people are much closer to the road, so I, I have a little concern about their level of noise reduction. Look, clearly we'll, there's going to be a traffic study done. We'll work with the city to minimize any, uh, any issues that we might have uh with noise or anything else to to do it in the least offensive way to the uh, the community um you know i know when i talked to some people they were concerned about using a 2a instead of two you know because then it goes through more neighborhoods i mean we'll, we'll make sure that the trucks don't uh, use any of those roads unless it's closed down or something too uh you know those kind of things i mean i, I can't say that there's not going to be any noise or anything along those lines uh, I, I won't or I can't commit necessarily to uh, uh, to running uh, uh, trucks with CNG engines, although I'm looking to do that, which is a, which is a lower noise kind of truck. Uh, you know, I'm talking to people about doing that. You know, it's all you know economics and stuff like that. But uh, you know, we'll do our best to uh, to minimize uh, any uh, any nuisances. All right. Um, so one final question. Is there going to be any public input about this? Or is it strictly going to be through the mayor and the city council? Or will the, will no, the people in that area be able to express their concerns? Ab absolutely. There's, there's a certain number of required uh, public meetings and, and how we communicate to the people and, uh, uh, you know, that, that's done regulatory-wise uh, by MEPA. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, and we clearly want to hear from them, too. I mean... It, it doesn't do us any good to put a facility in that uh, is going to cause problems or people are going to complain all the time. I just want to add to um, when we were talking with the permitting agencies to make sure there was a viable permitting pathway, um, MassDEP in particular um, made sure to um, give us guidance on a permitting pathway that included numerous public input sessions. Um, and that's, that's one one thing that they're making sure that we're incorporating into this project um, by proposing the permitting pathway that they did. Um, so once, once, we, once we get through the negotiation process and contracts are signed and everyone, everyone's got the, the formal buy-in to the project, then that's when we'll begin scheduling those sessions. Okay, thank you. 
Thank All you. right, I yield the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor, I saw your hand. Uh, I'm going to move us along just because we've been going quite a while now. Uh, I would encourage you to reach out to the DPW or to the uh, private partners after the meeting and to ask any further questions, and we will have this in front of us again for anything that got missed. All right? Yeah, I, I encourage you to, to meet with us and uh, any group of you want to get together uh, for a private little thing, especially the the, uh, the representative of that uh, you know that more community, you know that community that there, ward. that ward, and 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 make sure that we're doing the right things, right? And uh, you know we talked to the state reps, we had meetings with them to tell them what we were doing, and uh, you know we're 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 trying to communicate and make sure that everyone's uh, satisfied uh, with what we're doing. I'll talk to them after the meeting. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. This was very informative, and I look forward to hearing about next steps. Thank you all very much thank for you. your time. Appreciate thank you. you. Next up, we have a very brief housekeeping matter. When we accepted the report of the Legislative Affairs Committee, there was a typo in <coughs> Uh, where two, what we approved as 218.23 was actually put forward as initially uh, listed as 219.23. If there is no objection, I'm just going to deem that approved under the proper number, but I wanted to bring it in front of the council just to make sure no one had any problems. Seeing no objection, uh, we will deem that to have been approved under its proper number. Oh. Uh, and next we have a public hearing, 273.23, Comcast to request a grant of location for the purpose of installing new conduit to provide Comcast service to 100 Elm Street in Fitchburg. I now declare the hearing open. And yep, you may approach the podium and uh, present your petition. Good evening, Dave Flewelling, Comcast 9 Forbes Road, Woburn, Massachusetts. Like to speak in favor of the Comcast petition uh, to place one three inch PVC conduit 145 feet um, on Elm Street for the purpose of providing service to number 100 Elm Street. Uh, questions from councillors. I see Councillor Green. Uh, yes, uh, well, that conduit that will be underground, correct? Right. So no, no wires that Council Boschman has to worry about there being uh, <laughs> wires across the road or anything at that location. Coming down the utility pole and going into a new conduit and going to the building. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Council Kutcher. Uh, that 100 Elm Street, that's to the courthouse? Yes. Okay. Being, you know, in that courthouse, you know, quite frequently, um, they definitely need an upgrade. So, absolutely. Uh, Councillor Squalia. Thank you. Is this one of those situations where um, if we're having uh, trenching to run under this street um, to put in a conduit, we, uh, the city requires an additional conduit for our purposes? It will be an additional conduit. We, we put that on the plan. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fleming. Can we take this out of order? I'm just curious. Uh, no, this is, this is in order. We just had the... Uh, review of the report of the Legislative Affairs Committee, and then the next item is uh, number eight, public hearing. I have that on page four after the, the, the Legislative Affairs Report. Yes, we, the, the Legislative report? Affairs Report was already presented to the Council. There was just an error that oh, I okay. brought to the Council's right. attention. Everyone said there was no objection. And okay, then we then moved on. I, I misheard. Okay. Okay, no problem. Did you have a question? No, I don't. I just lowered my hand. Okay. Um, and I understand, uh, yeah, you can come on up. I understand there was a proposed modification uh, to the route to synergize better with our. Uh, Utility, our utilities upgrades? Correct. Um, so we met with Comcast out in the field, um, and as you all know, um, we're undertaking combined sewer separation work um, throughout the downtown corridor over the next several years. 
this is one of those areas. So in order to facilitate um, or avoid conflicts with that proposed combined sewer separation work, we recommended an alternative um, layout for the proposed installation of this conduit. Um, and that's reflected in a plan that um, I sent to President Zarella this evening. Um, and it shows an alignment that's underneath the sidewalk as opposed to within the roadway. Um, and Comcast agreed that that would be a, a preferable route to avoid uh, potential um, conflicts when we go to actually construct that combined sewer separation project. So they've agreed to install the conduit in that location and then also replace the sidewalks after excavating. Um, and those sidewalk replacements would be to City of Fitchburg standards and to the satisfaction of, of DPW engineering. All right, thank you. And yes, I, I did get this too late to pass it around to the rest of the council, but I'm happy to pass the paper around to whoever would like to see it. Yep, and that's, that's, and, uh, that's my- And will be filed with the clerk. My apologies for that. I, I forgot to send it ahead of the meeting tonight, so I oh. sent it at about 6 p.m. And so I will happily forward it first thing tomorrow morning to all of you for your records. Thank you. Yeah, no worries, it happens. <laughs> pass it on down. Uh, go ahead. Brief, uh, council, brief, brief question for you. Didn't they just replace the sidewalks around the courthouse? We did just replace those sidewalks, and it's unfortunate that this couldn't have been resolved prior to that work happening. Um, it, the only benefit here is that the sidewalk replacements will be at Comcast expense and not the city's. Um, so it, it breaks my heart to tell our own DPW guys that their work's going to be ripped up. Um, but this is really, really the only alignment that's available because of that combined sewer separation work that we're planning. So with that combined sewer separation work, we're installing a new drainage system in that area, and we're using fairly large excavators to dig to trenches to install that. So the concern is that if we try to install that conduit in the street and avoid those sidewalks, at some point the contractor that's installing the combined sewer separation drainage system might, might get into that trench and damage the conduits. Um, and I'd much rather have sidewalks um, in a, a planned effort to be excavated and reinstalled than damaging a conduit that houses a, a live communications wire. So um, it, it's unfortunate, but that's why we're here tonight. Um, I yield the floor. Further questions? Councilor Green. Um, yeah, Nick, specifically about the condition, the standard for Fitchburg sidewalks, that will be poured concrete, correct? Not asphalt? Correct, concrete oh. and granite. Okay. Yep. And that'll replace exactly what's there, which is concrete and granite. Okay, thank you. Further questions? I got a question. Go ahead. Since you're digging up the sidewalks that we put, took what, three months to do? Yep. My question to you is this. I notice when I'm down there at the Wallace, uh, on Wallace Ave and Elm Street, your ward, I notice the courthouse parks their cars on the sidewalk mm -hmm. all the time. Yep. So why can't we just make it flat? Yeah, so the cars can park instead of going up on a curb and they're parking on there. Well, technically, it's against city ordinance to park cars on a sidewalk, so that shouldn't be happening. Um, we've been asked recently to paint the curbing along that sidewalk yellow um, to, to highlight that to people that do park on that sidewalk. Um, and it's really something that, that should be enforced by FPD. Um, unfortunately, I often see law enforcement vehicles parked there on the sidewalk too, and that's, that's I got another a picture separate of matter entirely. I have a picture of it. No need for submission of evidence at this time, <laughs> Counselor. <laughs> well, I just wanted to, but there's state employees that park on that sidewalk, not to pick on them. Okay. Counselor Kutcher? Thank you very much. Uh, no, just uh, going forward on that, um, it is noted by Judge Lacanto, who is the, you know, the um, head judge at the Fitchburg District Court, that it is, in fact, uh, local and state police that pull up onto the curb and to the sidewalk. And he reached out to me, even though it's not my warden, he reached out to me asking me to ask the DPW to please paint the uh, curb bright yellow in order to be able to show the police, both local and state, to not pull up on that sidewalk. So uh, the judge in uh, Fitchburg District Court is more than aware of what's going on in there. And in fact, he embarrasses uh, any police officer who walks into his courtroom who's parked on the curb. And he does so with great effect. Does he? Very, very great effect. 
I imagine so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, any further questions? Just want to oh, add one thing. Um, so th this obviously highlights a, a need for better coordination between the DPW and Comcast. Um, we've made that, that clear to Comcast, and you know, now that I have Dave con Dave's contact information, um, hopefully that, that communication can improve. Um, I think the DPW does an excellent job coordinating with Unitil, uh, but not so much with Comcast and Verizon. So we're hoping to improve, use this as, as a reason to improve that coordination between uh, us and, and those two entities at a minimum. Much appreciated. Do I have motion a motion? to approve. I have a motion. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. This is a public hearing. So uh, despite the empty gallery, I do have to ask if there is anyone present who would like to speak in favor of this petition. Seeing none. Any in opposition? Seeing none. I, I declare this hearing closed. And the matter is before the council. Move to approve. Second. Motion and second to approve. Uh, any opposition? It is unanimously approved. Thank you very much. Merry uh, Christmas. We do have a request for suspension of the rules on 275.23. This is the now standard transfer of the uh, PEG funds from the city to FATV pursuant to our agreements and obligations. So with moved. Them. Second. Motion and second for suspension of the rules. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll for a two thirds vote. Councilor Shields? Yes. Councilor Squalia? Aye. Councilor Van Hazinger? Yes. President Zarella? Yes. Councilor Boschman? Yes. Councilor Kucher? Yes. Councilor Cragen? Yes. Councilor Cruz? Yes. Councilor Di Natale? Yes. Councilor Fleming? Yes. And Councilor Green? Yes. Passes 11 members. All right, and motion now, we accept. Second. second. Thank you very much. I uh, have a motion and second to accept 275.23. Any objections? It is passed by unanimous consent. Uh, I would ask that we waive the reading on 276 through 280.23. So, so moved. So moved. Yeah. Second. All right, any objections? All right, reading waived. That is referred to finance. And last, we have one side yard sales order. Uh, if it is my understanding that this has already passed through side yard sales uh, and is now before us to approve the actual transfer of land. Uh, this is 10 Northman Passway uh, and includes all the standard conditions, including the obligation to keep the lot clean and maintained. Motion to approve. Second. second. I have a motion and second to approve. Any questions or objections on the motion? All right, it is unanimously approved, and that concludes our business. Motion I'd like adjourned. to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas uh, or any other holiday that people may uh, celebrate this time of year. Festivus. Festivus, <laughs> sure. A very Merry Festivus as well. I, Council Boschman, you had. <laughs> I wanted to wish my fellow councillors a Merry Christmas because I know Santa's going to be good to me. I already get to know <laughs> So, and the people of Fitchburg, I want to wish them a Merry Christmas. And Vinny. <laughs> the people of Fitchburg and Vinny. Okay. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> All right, I have a motion and second to adjourn. Second. Hearing no objection, we are adjourned.